haunted roads and houses, cryptids that aren't skinwalkers or wendigo, and mysteriously shaking beds. All of this and more in today's horrifying episode. So grab your lucky pants with a weird stain and send me a letter in the mail because I get lonely. These are six allegedly true scary stories about haunts and horrors. If you have a story or creepy experience you want to share, send it to us at darknessprevails.org. Now, let's do this. The Road to Nowhere from Marissa. There's an infamously haunted road placed inside a reservoir within the city near where I live. This road connects two major highways, but as it tends to flood so often, it's long, winding, and cloaked under the cover of trees. No houses or businesses for miles on either side. You can imagine that come nightfall, it becomes pitch black. Next to it is a cemetery whose ancestors have long since passed or moved away. It's known as the Blue Light Cemetery due to the eerie luminescent glow that surrounds it. For decades, people have explored this area and the stories of the unexplained have grown here over the years. One of these stories features a woman in white who is often seen walking down the road, never showing her face. Another surrounds the sounds of marching as it was allegedly a Civil War campsite. The list of stories and encounters goes on as time does, and people go to satisfy their curiosity. I learned a lot about this place. I was drawn to it, almost obsessed with it. It didn't take long for me to convince my friends to drive out there as often as possible, always at night, always with the thrill of what we might encounter. The first few times we went, only minor things were seen. You see, the lore connected to this road consists of parking on a bridge and shutting off the engine in silence for a while, surrounded by the dark. All we saw those first few times were red and white lights in the distance, moving in a subtle but strange way that was hard to explain. Unimpressed by this, we left, and it was just in time too because a patrol car came up behind us. We all had the same thought, get ready to see a different set of red and white lights. We braced ourselves to be pulled over by the cop, who simply drove past us, but slowly looked us over as he did, like we were suspicious. I caught a look at his face, but nothing came of it until we went around one of the winding curves and his car was nowhere in sight. It was dark enough out, that it would be insane for us not to be able to see his rear lights as he drove off in any direction. We chalked it up as odd, but probably explainable, then left. I managed to convince them to try one more time later that same night. Only this time, I suggested we get out and walk a little ways from the car. I was young and determined to see something, anything really. I wanted to be scared or amazed. The first thing I noticed was how silent it was. You would normally hear small animals, birds, or bugs, but something in that summer night out there in the middle of nowhere had scared everything silent. There was hardly even a breeze moving through the trees until suddenly, in every direction, we heard the sound of stomping feet. Leaves and sticks cracked like thunder in that silence. It was louder than I can even convey here, but it sounded like hundreds of men were rapidly walking around us and towards us. My friends all turned and immediately ran back to the car. I'll admit I was hesitant at first, but the fight or flight mechanism had been triggered deep down in me, and I knew this was not a fight I could win or probably even participate in except to lose. As we burned rubber getting out of there, lo and behold, the same police cruiser we saw before passed right by again where we had last seen him. This time he did flash his lights as he slowed to a stop next to our car. It was the same man too. We rolled down our window, bracing ourselves for whatever he was about to say to us, 
all of us still a bit shaken from the sounds we had heard. You kids shouldn't be out here at this time of night, he said to us. My friend quickly replied, Yes, sir. We're just driving through on our way home. The officer stared us down for a while before rolling up his window and finally driving away. Something wasn't quite right about him. We didn't drive away just yet because I put my hand on the wheel and asked my friend to wait. He wasn't too thrilled to stay there much longer, but we all turned to watch as the police officer's taillights disappeared into thin air along with the rest of his vehicle. They just vanished, just like they did last time. We didn't go back there again, but I know others who have. I asked about any encounters with law enforcement, and many of them say they saw the same man, even though I'd never told them our story. Even fewer of them have spoken with him as we had done. However, it was always the same message. You kids shouldn't be out too late. Whether he's just a friendly cop doing his duty or something else entirely, I've heeded his warning ever since. Bus Stop Visitor from Eason's Mom When I was around 11 years old, I was visited by a spirit while standing at my bus stop. That morning, my alarm failed to wake me up, and for some reason, I just happened to open my eyes and found that there was 15 minutes until the bus was to arrive. I was running way behind, so I threw something on, used some mouthwash instead of brushing, and grabbed my bag before flying out the door toward the bus stop. Now, I have Native American heritage, and I take my culture seriously. Anyway, I'm standing at my stop waiting for the bus driver to show up, who was notoriously late. I stand up after tying my shoe and glance across the road to the abandoned driveway to the left. I immediately froze. Standing about six and a half feet tall was a Native American male with long braids, one on each shoulder, dressed in a flannel shirt and ripped up blue jeans. He looked so out of place it was hard to explain, but I knew this was something odd to see out here. My suspicions were confirmed when a car passed by, and the moment it was out of view, the man had vanished, leaving only a human-shaped mist in its wake. It was a quick experience, and my bus soon arrived, but it was something so bizarre, so otherworldly, that I won't soon forget it. The Thing in the Barn, from See No Evil 18. It happened about three years ago. I was 15. My parents were going out of town, which meant I was staying with my grandma, who lived right next door to us. I stayed there because I didn't want to stay at the house by myself. I always had a fear of being alone at that house at night, and I always thought our barn was creepy. So at my grandma's house, I had a room with a couple of game systems. Later that evening, when I was playing some games, I heard what sounded like scratching coming from the outside. It was like something hard scraping on glass. I ignored it, too scared to check it out and too scared to want to think about it for too long. Around that time, my grandma called me from downstairs. She was making dinner that night and needed some seasoning so she asked me to walk over to my parents' place to see if we had any. I was nervous because it was dark out and my parents' house was about 50 yards away from my grandma's, which meant quite a short but very creepy walk there and back, all by myself. When I started my journey, I had a strange feeling like something was watching me, and also everything outside was quiet. No animals, no insects, no trees, no wind just my footsteps. Thankfully, I made it to the house okay. I grabbed the seasoning, and as I closed the cabinet, I heard a different sound coming from outside. When I turned to look, I swallowed hard, because whatever the sound was from, it was coming from the barn, 
the dreary, dark barn. The door to the barn, which had been closed this whole time, was now open. As I said before, there was no wind on that night, so how it had been opened, I have no idea. It was so strange, I was beginning to panic. I hurried, shoving the seasoning in my pocket, making a run for the door, and sprinting back to my grandma's house, but as soon as I began to break into a run, the door to the barn slammed shut. I turned around. I knew I shouldn't have, but I did. That was a mistake. I turned and immediately thought I was looking at a person, someone coming out of the barn, but as my brain took in the picture of this thing, I realized it was no man. Its body was elongated and hairless. It began bolting towards me at an unnatural speed, appendages flicking about on the ground like some sort of giant insect. As fast as I could move, I ran to my grandma's house. I could hear its nasty footsteps as I was running. For every step I took, it took at least a dozen. It was outpacing me fast, but hopefully I could make it back to the house given how short the distance was. But honestly, I thought I was a goner until my grandma came outside. The expression on her face was one of horror, but the moment she opened that door, I heard the creature's inhuman footsteps dart in another direction and disappear. I tried to ask my grandma if she saw it, but for some reason, she ignored my questions. Was she in shock, or was I mistaken about her having seen it? Later that night, I woke up and looked outside my window. When I did, I saw that same animal standing there out in the fields, dragging what appeared to be some animal corpse. It dragged the poor thing along the ground all the way to the barn, then pulled it inside, as if our barn was its den. I never went back to sleep that night, and my family would later clean out that barn finding remains of dozens of different animals inside. To this day, if you dig deep enough, there's more bones than you can count. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever witnessed, and even now, I have no idea what that creature was. Big Horned Monster from Rexy To give some background on me, I was 12 years old at the time. It was summer 2014, and I was taking a trip to Shared in Wyoming for polo purposes. Polo is a game that requires training horses, so my mentor usually brought horses into the mountains of the Bighorn National Forest in order to gain the most trust possible from our horses and to move about 800 cattle up the mountain for the summer. You should know here that my mentor has lived and worked in these forests for over 40 years, ever since he was a kid. Five of us met on the side of a road at around 4 a.m., about half a mile from a lodging community called Teepee. I later looked this place up on Google Maps, and we parked on these coordinates. We parked on the gravel road, and through a hazy half-moon morning, a large tilted field uncovered itself surrounded by dense pine forest. As we unloaded our horses, we quickly located the black cows and surrounded them, making sure we didn't miss a single one. About an hour passed, and the sky turned from a black canvas to a dark, bluish haze. It was still dark and even colder now, but the cozy layers of chaps and jackets kept me warm enough. The five of us met up, and my mentor decided that he and the other three will start to move the cattle deeper into the mountains, where he leased the land to keep the cattle for the rest of the year. This left me and my horse to gather any remaining cattle that may have slipped out of the group. As they left, I made my way down a steep grassy slope towards a ravine about 600 feet down. This is where any cattle would have been if they slipped by. As I followed the stream up, I found no cattle. Partially relieved that I didn't have to round up any cattle, I slowly grew scared and started my way back up the hill to the road, 
so I didn't have to be in the dark alone any longer. 300 feet and 10 minutes later, I heard a rustle. My heart skipped a beat. After almost an instant, a small calf jumped from the forest and ran up the road to look for her mother. A wave of relief followed as a cool sigh left my lips. I tried to get the horse to keep going, but it wouldn't budge. As I looked down, I saw that the horse was on full alert. Ears pointed up, eyes opened extremely wide, looking off into the distance, into the woods. I stared in between the trees and saw what I thought was a bull. It had black mats of hair with encrusted mud and dirt all over its back. Now, the horse I was on has seen bulls before, but I've never seen him freeze up like that, especially not for this long. Wondering why this was happening, I began nudging, kicking, and shouting at him to move. But it was no use. It seemed like another five minutes went by when I finally gave up, just sitting there on its back. As I looked back toward the figure in the distance, I saw the bull now standing up on two feet. This wasn't a bull, but it was huge, and it had horns. This was no animal that I was used to, let alone one that I'd ever heard of. I could tell that it was looking in this direction. I didn't want to stick around here any longer. After a few moments, my horse began to rear up, almost landing on its back and crushing me. Luckily, it came back down on all fours and began to sprint at full speed up the hill toward the road. I laid low on the horse's neck, holding on for dear life. After what seemed like several minutes, I felt myself being thrown from the saddle. As I flew off and into the air, I hoped for dear life that the thing wouldn't get to me. After seconds of flight time, I landed in what I thought would be hard ground, but instead, I landed in what I realized was a bog. The muddy quicksand engulfed my body to the torso. I looked up and saw my horse shoulder deep in mud, jumping desperately and struggling to get out. I crawled to the surface, hanging on to rocks nearby and pulling my body up. Before I could get all the way up, my horse scattered to the edge and ran as fast as it could down the road, finally getting away from me. I was struggling to stand, but I scurried the remainder of the way to the road, and I started to follow it to where the rest of my crew should be, but I was shaking and absolutely horrified. I started walking, but I stood frozen when a loud shriek pierced my ears as if someone was screaming at the top of their lungs only inches away from me. At that moment, I ran with all the life I had left, struggling with the weight of my jackets, chaps, boots, and mud weighing me down. However, the adrenaline filled my body as I pushed on as far as possible, ears ringing. After several minutes had passed, I finally reached my crew a mile up the road. The four of them turned and looked at me, staring at me like they had seen a ghost. One of them was holding on to the reins of my injured horse. My mentor, however, looked at me with a curious smile, then turned into a dreadful, serious face. The rest of the day was more solemn between us. My mentor had us move in a faster pace as if he wanted us out of there as soon as possible, and I understood why now. I didn't tell him much, except for the fact that I fell into a bog of quicksand and that there were no other cows left behind. As that day passed on, I thought of what might have happened if my horse didn't notice that thing, or if it had reared and fallen on me, or if I landed on those rocks instead of the mud. I was grateful that all the likely outcomes didn't happen, and also grateful that I didn't have any nightmares or visions of that nightmarish creature. I made it out of this okay. The horse, however, was a different story. We could tell that the horse was different after that night. Jumpy, no longer trusting of anyone who had raised or trained him. He wasn't injured physically, save for some scrapes and cuts from brambles. 
and eventually the horse went back to normal. As for the two of us, I don't think we'll ever go back in those woods alone again. If you're in the woods, it's always best to never split up from your group. Always have a partner. Thing in the Bushes from Svetislav I was 13 years old and living in Bulgaria. This story began when me and a friend of mine were on our way to school early in the morning when it was still dark out. To get to school at the time, we needed to go through the forest, and yes, we walked our way to school. We were just passing the time talking about random things, when suddenly I heard something to the left of us. As we kept going, I would hear it again and again coming from the same side, and my friend was beginning to hear it as well. As the sound followed us, no matter how far we went, it was starting to worry the both of us. It could have been someone following us. Then came the most insane sound I'd ever heard in those woods. It sounded like a dying goat. I began to panic and pulled out a little butterfly knife that I kept. My friend and I moved closer together and faster. We kept making our way to school, hoping nothing would happen. And we made it there okay. But the entire day I was at school, I knew we'd have to venture back through those woods to get home, and I was afraid that we'd run into the thing that I'd heard. After school that day, we walked even slower than before. Our exhaustion from the school day and our fear that had been building up got the better of us. I know we probably should have hurried, but we were shivering, and it wasn't from the cold. But that afternoon we saw the strangest thing come out of the bushes. Imagine a plump little pig, but with its skin peeled off, and instead of skin, a transparent layer where you could see blood moving through its veins. It was so weird, so creepy. I was in shock. We just kept staring at the thing until my friend screamed and we began to run out of the forest. We went back to my house fast, Mine was the closest. I still haven't figured out what that thing was. It doesn't really match any urban legends or mythical creatures we've heard of. So if you have any idea, we'd love to know. I hope I don't see it again. It might not be dangerous, but it's not something you enjoy looking at. Why is my bed shaking? From Sadako, 1580. This started happening when I was 12. I had a waterbed. I would be lying still and there would be ripples out of nowhere, like someone had poked the bottom corner of the bed. I would always convince myself somehow that it was my fault, even though I didn't move. Years later, when I was 16, my little sister wanted to trade rooms with me. Funny thing was, she didn't even ask. She just said, we're trading rooms now, okay? I thought this was strange since her room had a phone jack. This was the 90s, so we didn't have cell phones. And what teenage girl didn't want a phone in her room? So without a word, I agreed to trade with her. Then things began to escalate. I always felt like someone was in the room with me, like someone was staring at me at every moment. I would often rip off my headphones and look around the room, only to find that no one was there. One morning, I was half asleep when I heard things fall from a shelf, but I told myself it was just the cat, then went back to sleep. When I got up, I realized my door was shut, so there was no way the cat could have been in my room. My toys had been scattered all over the floor. They didn't just fall. It was more like someone had violently thrown them off the shelf. Then my bed would start to shake some nights, not just little ripples. It was like someone was shaking the frame as violently as possible, and I could no longer convince myself that I was causing all of this. Sometimes it would sound like a small animal was running around the room at night or in circles around the bed. I knew it wasn't squirrels or raccoons on the roof because I knew what those sounded like. I thought that it was a ghost of a cat, if anything. I even told my family about it, 
they told me that I was living in my own little world, that I was just crazy. So I lived with this, realizing that whatever it was wasn't going to hurt me, I didn't think, and I wasn't afraid of it anymore. It was just kind of there. One day out of the blue, my sister told me that she wanted to trade rooms again because she saw a wolf with red glowing eyes looking at her at night. I sarcastically said, thanks for sticking me with the haunted room and for calling me a crazy along with mom and dad when I tried to say something about it. I felt betrayed. We actually argued about whether the ghost in my room was a wolf or a cat. I remember trying to talk about it again after we stopped fighting, but she said that she didn't believe in ghosts and that she never saw anything of the sort. This was beginning to make me feel like I was actually crazy, like my parents had said. So I moved out when I was 19, and whatever that was that was shaking the bed, it came with me. Though it wasn't as intense, and it only happened when I was upset or nervous. My bed would shake, and I would be like, oh, there it is again. It had become something normal to me. It would gradually begin to fade, and I forgot about it for a long time. I'm only remembering it now because I moved back home to take care of my mother. When I got back, she told me one day that she saw my cat again. I said, I don't have a cat anymore. He died a long time ago. She said to me, no, not that one. The ghost one you used to talk about. I saw it. It was slinking down the upstairs hallway like a shadow. My mom is elderly but not senile, and I definitely believed her. But I was floored. There were so many times I thought I was going crazy, but someone finally experienced the ghost cat. And it was a cat. I was right. I actually haven't experienced much since moving back in. There was an occasion where it sounded like someone tried to open my bedroom door at night, but I didn't hear anyone in the hallway. All I did hear was a distinct knob rattle. The house is old and creaky after all, and there's no way someone could have done that without me hearing them coming. So apparently whatever this entity was, they're still here in the house. They're still here following me, but they're as lazy as ever and when they do act up, I've learned to live with it. Mysterious creatures, entities that defy death, and haunted houses that you don't want to ever go near. That was today's Darkness Prevails episode, and I hope you enjoyed. Remember, if you have a story of your own that you'd like to share, send it to us at darknessprevails.org submit. If you want to support the show in another way, you can go to the links below. There's a link to my store where you can get some creepy cool shirts, or you can donate to my Patreon via another link. Thank you so much. Now as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous episode, titled, There's Something Wrong With Our Woods. Fireshard 2 Vlog says, Hey, have you seen my sanity? Yeah, it's probably out back hanging out with my coolness, which doesn't exist. I'll never find it. James Coburn says, my grandma just gave me a batch of jelly rolls and you just uploaded a video. This is going to be a good time. Well, I hope you filmed that. A sugar rush mixed with a nightmare sounds awesome. No Need says, these stories have me psyched to go camping and sing the song of my people. Are your people skinwalkers? Because most people would be afraid to go into the woods after hearing these stories. The Shape 1978 says, Snoochy Boochies. I don't know what that means, but maybe it's something like Sneed and Feed. And if you understand that, you browse the worst part of 4chan. And Microsoft World says, Ha, ah, this ain't scary. If you saw the babushka with a Kalashnik in Primyets, you don't fear anything. Yeah, if you maintain your sanity after meeting an old monstrous woman living in a chicken leg house, then I give props to you. Well, that brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode. But don't you worry, more scary stories are on the way soon, so stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my patrons who continue to donate. 
they're amazingly attractive people. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.